Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for another tier list. Today we are going to be going through the discography of the incredibly unique English band Japan. And this was a band that I had discovered a little bit later in life, but upon hearing them I was immediately intrigued by their sound and I just needed to dive into their discography and see what they were all about. And one of the great things about them is in addition to their albums as a group, they also have a very extensive set of solo albums from each individual member, as well as a wide Wide variety of different collaboration albums from different members of the group so there is really an amazing little world of music to be explored through this group and like I said one of the most unique groups that I have discovered in recent years so I'm very excited to be making this video and what I'm gonna do is go through their five studio albums and their one album released as Rain Tree Crow and I'll score each of them on this tier list with S being the highest and D being the lowest and I'll let you know my thoughts and talk a little bit about each album and we will see where we end up up. And please feel free to let me know your thoughts in the comments as well. I would love to hear where you rank these albums and where you agree and disagree with my takes. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. Let's jump right into it. All right, we will start out with their debut studio album from 1978 titled Adolescent Sex. And unfortunately, I'm going to give this one a C. I've always had a bit of a hard time with this album. I don't think it is the strongest debut album that they could have put out. But at the same time, I wouldn't say that it's terrible. It does have some redeeming qualities. Stylistically, this one is much different from what their later albums would sound like. This one is much more in that glam rock, new wave, post-punk sort of realm. And seeing the evolution in their sound from where they start out to where they end up is really fascinating. It opens up with Transmission which I've always found to be a weak opener to the album. Not a song that I find particularly engaging or really attention grabbing. Uh, I do really like the keyboard sounds that they use on it, but other than that, it's always been sort of a skip over track for me. And then we have The Unconventional, which is a groovy, dancey sort of track. Not a bad song. I like it more than the opener, but I also wouldn't say it's one of the standout tracks on this album for me. And that is followed by Wish You Were Black, a song that is in a similar realm to the previous track. Not a bad song, but once again, nothing that I would consider really standout or exceptional in the Japan discography. Uh, the one thing that I have always found cool about this song, though, is the groove between the bass and the drums. It's got that one hit that comes in after beat two in a very unconventional spot, which creates this really unique groove that almost sounds a little disorienting, which I find really cool. And little subtle things like that are one example of why I find this band and so intriguing. After that, we have probably my least favorite song on this album titled Performance. I've never found this to be an exciting track. It's always been a skip over one for me. And then we have another song that I'm sort of indifferent about, Lovers on Main Street. So as you could see, I don't really enjoy the majority of the tracks on side one. But luckily it wraps up on a good note with a very cool cover of the song Don't Rain on My Parade from the musical Funny Girl. A great example of how they take a song that is stylistically very different from their sound and then they just completely make it their own with some punk flavors thrown in there and I think it turned out great. It's a really solid cover and definitely the high point of side one for me. Then we switch over to side two and that opens up with Suburban Love which is not a bad song but I do think that it does go on for a tad long and starts to drag a little bit. Uh, and then we have the title track, Adolescent Sex, which is definitely my favorite song from this album. Super catchy, really groovy, really tasteful contrast between the two sections great keyboard sounds and I think for this stylistic side of Japan that we get on this album a song like this is about as good as it gets and then the next song communist China would actually be my second favorite track from this album so side two for me is definitely much more redeeming from the weaker parts of side one and I think this track probably has the most resemblance to what we will hear from later Japan albums but still very much fits within the context of this album as well um, and then the album concludes with television a track that is a little over nine minutes long it really stretches out and takes its time and I think this song is pretty cool it's definitely not a bad closer and has some really tasteful grooves throughout I love the little keyboard sequence that comes in at the very end a really cool surprise that wraps things up in a very interesting way and yeah so as you could see side two is really the high point of this album for me side one doesn't resonate with me that much with the exception of that one cover song but regardless of that I do think Think that this album still has a couple of really solid tracks that I would regard as classics in the Japan discography. So I would say it's not an awful album, but definitely not the strongest opener either, in my opinion. So this one gets a C. 
All right, next we have their second studio album, also released in 1978, titled Obscure Alternatives. And I'm going to give this one a B. Not a bad album, and I would say that it is a slight improvement upon adolescent sex. Stylistically, it is still in a similar new wavy post-punk sort of realm, but I do think that some of the songs do improve in quality, and we get a few more hints of the sound shift that they would make in their future albums as well, which is another thing that I like more about this album. Similar to the first release, it does have a few songs that I don't care for, but the songs that I do like are of a little bit higher quality than adolescent sex, in my opinion. I do think that the weakest part of this album is actually the opening two tracks, Automatic Gun and Rhodesia. Both songs I find kind of boring. I don't think that they are great opening tracks to really bring the listener in and get them excited about what's to come. I do, however, absolutely love track three, titled Love is Infectious. This is a great example of a song that still fits stylistically with the rest of the album, but is also incorporating some new elements with more experimental harmonies, really cool writing within the two guitars, and the guitar solo starts out very tonally ambiguous. Just a very cool sounding track. Um, I really enjoy this one. And then Side One concludes with one of the singles titled Sometimes I Feel So Low. A pretty good song, but I wouldn't say it's one of my favorites on here, but also not a skip over track either, somewhere in between for me. So similar to what I said with Adolescent Sex, once we get to Side Two on this album, this is where I feel like the momentum really picks up. I enjoy all four songs on Side Two, uh, opening with the title track, Obscure Alternatives, a mid-tempo song that really takes its time and just adds layers upon layers and builds very nicely. I love the spacey use of the keyboards throughout. Mick Karn has some really groovy bass parts and the way it eventually builds into the last part of the song just feels very satisfying. Really great opener to side two. Then after that we have Deviation which brings us back into that funky realm. Just a really nice feel-good groovy song with nice horn backgrounds and I love the utilization of the synth throughout this one as well. Then we have Suburban Berlin which takes some really interesting turns from section to section with really great contrasts. The chorus always feels so satisfying to me when it comes in. Just a really nice feel-good burst of energy which I love. And then the album closes with easily my favorite track on here titled The Tenant, which is a beautiful seven minute instrumental track that shows a clear departure from everything else that we've heard on this album and gives us a very clear taste of what is to come for the next few albums. It has such beautiful piano work with great melodies, cool background synth layers, and also some great saxophone work from Mick Karn as well, really demonstrating his amazing well-rounded musicianship on multiple instruments which we will hear more and more on future albums. Just a perfect closing track to leave the listener off on a cliffhanger making them wonder what is to come in the future albums. And yeah so as you can see I do enjoy a lot of the songs on here. I enjoy all of side two and a couple of the tracks on side one are also good but also at the same time with the exception of The Tenant I wouldn't say any of these songs would be considered any of my favorite songs from the Japan discography. So I would say it's an upgrade from Adolescent Sex with some better songs, but at the same time, not an exceptional album, but still a nice little improvement from their opening album. So I will give this one a B. Okay, next we have their third studio album from 1979 titled Quiet Life. I absolutely love this album. This one easily gets an S. On this release, we hear a significant shift stylistically, much less glam rocky and more into that synth pop, you know, artsy sort of realm with much deeper explorations from an instrumental and production standpoint. We also hear a shift in David Sylvian's vocal stylings as well, which I think was much more fitting for this new sound. And according to David Sylvian, this was the one Japan album where all of the members worked in a very collaborative manner, and a lot of people regard this as their favorite Japan album. And while I do love this album, it actually isn't my number one favorite. We will get to that in a little bit, uh, but still an incredible album. Uh, we open up with the amazing title track, Quiet Life, which is a great introduction into this new sound, starting out with a sequenced synth part with some guitar chord hits on top of it, a really nice contrast from section to section 
section with the opening part being a little more dancey and poppy and then the second section gets a little darker and more mysterious a really great opener and an awesome way to establish this new sound of japan then we go into fall in love with me which is an amazing follow-up track it has a great energy and intensity to it i particularly love the vocal melodies on this one i think they're super catchy and so much stuff is going on instrumentally too between the layered synth parts the really tasty bass lines and the drum groove alternating between the snare on all four beats for the first section and then the disco sort of beat for the second section just a really cool song then we bring things down a bit with a slower ballad titled despair a piano centered song that is mostly instrumental and features some beautiful saxophone work from mick karn this one is very much in a similar realm to the closing track on obscure alternatives a really nice contrast and a change of pace from the opening two tracks placed very effectively and then we conclude side one with in vogue which brings us back into some more groovy territory a really nice solid song that wraps up side one very nice Nicely. I really love the extended instrumental section for the last couple of minutes as well. Just such a great groove that's really nice just to vibe out to. Then we open up side two with Halloween. Another song with great contrasting sections with the opening section being a bit darker and mysterious, largely due to the synth background parts. And then section two gets a little more feel good. I also love Mick Karn's harmonized horn parts in this one as well. A really solid opener to side two. And then that is followed by the the one cover song on this album, which is a Lou Reed song titled All Tomorrow's Parties. I've always thought this was a really unique and awesome cover and definitely provides a nice contrast from everything else on this album, but still very much fits with the context of the album and doesn't sound out of place. And Japan is really great about doing cover songs and really making them their own, as we heard on Adolescent Sex with Don't Rain on My Parade, and we will hear that again on the next album. Uh, and then that track is followed by Alien. I absolutely love Love this song probably the grooviest track from this album in my opinion i just love the drum and bass groove so much and the horn parts hit so hard and then we conclude the album with the other side of life an absolutely incredible closer and probably my favorite song on this album it's just got such a great intensity to it it builds so nicely i particularly love the last instrumental chunk of the song with those really beautiful keyboard melodies combined with the beautiful layers upon layers of synth sounds such a beautiful and powerful conclusion to an incredible album so just so much good stuff going on here i don't think there is a bad song on this album i love everything that they did stylistically with the new wide variety of different synth sounds the much broader experimentation with the instrumentation as well as the production and i think the songwriting reached a whole new level and set a great framework for them to continue to build off of on their future releases so incredible album this one gets an easy s all right, next we have their fourth studio album from 1980 titled Gentlemen Take Polaroids. And this is another one that gets an easy S. And this is actually my favorite Japan album. I think this album is perfect. This is their first album for Virgin Records, and according to David Sylvian, by this point he had become a paranoid perfectionist with the music and the way that he wanted everything to come out, and ultimately this would be the reason that the band would end up breaking up. Uh, this is also the final album to feature guitarist Rob Dean as well, and one thing I've always particularly loved about this album is the wide use of synthesizers in the most tasteful way possible. This album has some of my favorite synth writing and layering of any album ever written. Side one opens up with the title track and single from this album gentlemen take polaroids an amazing song with a rich arrangement great writing between the guitars and the synthesizers a song that captures that perfect combination of pop and experimentation and just in general throughout this whole album i think that the synth writing and the layering and the way that the synths are written against the guitar parts is just so unique and so strong to me albums like these are some of the strongest contributions to 80s music and are such a nice contrast to the large amount of cheesy stuff that had come out of the 80s and I really you know thank God for bands like Japan existing in the 80s I think bands like them really saved 80s music then we have track two titled swing once again beautiful synth parts and a seriously groovy bass line from mick karn and mick's bass lines are another standout part of this album for me his bass writing is great on every album but i think this album in particular is really exceptional every single track has these really groovy and unique bass parts that i just love we also hear some more saxophone from mick as well which is always great to hear uh, and then we bring things down a bit with burning bridges a very haunting song 
song that is mostly instrumental. This one has always reminded me of a song that could have been on like the David Bowie album Low. I think the mood and the synth sounds are very much in that vein. And this song provides a really nice contrast from the more drum, you know, groove heavy opening two tracks. Then we conclude with my favorite track of side one titled My New Career. This song has such a cool, mysterious sort of vibe to it. It's got this tense bass line utilizing the tritone interval a lot, and the synth layers on this one are absolutely beautiful. This is one of those songs that just puts me in such a vibe every time I listen to it. Then we go to side two, which opens up with a really intense, high energy song called Methods of Dance, a perfect opening track. I love the 16th note synth sequence, serving as sort of a backdrop for a lot of the song, and I particularly love the chorus of this one. It just hits so hard when it comes in, and mix background horn parts to me just completely tie that section together. Then after that, we go into one of the most unique and bizarre covers that I've ever heard uh, of a song called Ain't That Peculiar, written by Smokey Robinson and recorded by Marvin Gaye. I would say this has got to be my favorite song on the album, uh, and when I initially heard it, I didn't even realize it was a cover. I kept coming back to this track because I thought it sounded so cool. And then when I found out it was a cover, I was just completely taken back by it. Uh, other than the lyrics, there is really no resemblance whatsoever to the original version of this song. Uh, this has got to be the most interesting cover I've ever heard, and a great example of the brilliant and unique mind of David Sylvian. I don't know many other people that would be able to come up with a cover as interesting as this one. Just an absolutely incredible song. I really love that recorder line that Mick does towards the end of the song as well. Just a little subtle thing, but I think it adds so much to the song. Then we bring things down a bit with a beautiful piano-centered ballad titled Night Porter. Once again, similar to Burning Bridges, it is placed in a perfect spot, providing a nice contrast from the more energetic first two tracks of Side 2, and it sets up the closing track very nicely, which is Taking Islands in Africa. Again, amazing layers upon layers of different synthesizers. One thing that I will say about this song is that although I do enjoy it a lot, I don't think it's a bad song by any stretch. If I had to pick a least favorite song from the album, it would probably be this one. I do think that Quiet Life has a better closer, but like I said, this is definitely not a bad song, and the other seven are just so unbelievably good that it just carries the entire album. So yeah, like I said, this is my favorite Japan album. Sometimes I flip-flop on what my favorite Japan album is, but this one is definitely the most consistent one that falls into number one. Uh, so yeah, absolutely incredible album. This one gets an easy S. All right, now we have their fifth and final studio album, As Japan, from 1981, titled Tin Drum. Another one that is an easy S, absolutely amazing album, following in the same vein as Quiet Life and Gentlemen Take Polaroids, but also introducing some more Eastern influences as well due to David's fascination at that time with Eastern culture. Side One opens up with a really cool track titled The Art of Parties, which to me has always had a similar stylistic feel to the opening of Gentlemen Take Polaroids, in the sense that it's got that great combination of those groovy, poppy vibes mixed in with some more experimental elements as well. Again, absolutely amazing synth sounds and super groovy bass lines from Mick. Then it goes into Talking Drum, which has some similar feels as the opener, but also starts to show some more of those Eastern flavors with some of the background parts with the Chinese instrument, the Swona, being done by Mick. I believe that's the instrument that he's playing on there. If I'm wrong, please correct me in the comments about that. But again, Mick's versatility as a multi-instrumentalist really cannot be overstated, and I think he has always been the secret weapon of Japan. Then we continue with hands down my favorite track from the album titled Ghosts, an absolutely beautiful ballad. And to me, a song like this is David Sylvian at his peak compositionally. The way it opens up with these eerie synth parts coming in all directions over David's vocals, and then the chords enter, and the song gets going from that point on, and it just takes us through this incredible journey. David Sylvian has said that this was one of the only songs that he wrote where he let some personal stuff come through as well, and it served as a precursor to his amazing solo career as well. I cannot say enough good things about this song. This would easily make my top three favorite Japan songs. Then that is followed by an instrumental titled Canton, which is a track written by David Sylvian and Steve Jansen. A great and catchy track with some great melodies going on, and again, really capturing those Eastern flavors. A great conclusion to side one and then side B opens up with still life in mobile homes 
Such cool grooves on this song with the drums having the snare hits on beats 1 and 2 and then the bass filling in the space for the remaining beats. Really unique synth sounds layered all over this song too. The synth sounds on this album in particular have always sort of reminded me of like vintage video game sounds which is really cool. And then that is followed by Visions of China, another super groovy song which obviously based on the name is going to feature more of those eastern influences as well with that Swona instrument being used again. Uh, again, if I'm incorrect about that instrument, please let me know in the comments because that was one little bit of information that I couldn't find a ton of stuff about online. And it's unfortunate that this would end up being the final Japan album because it would have been so interesting to see what sorts of influences David Sylvian would develop in the coming years and how the Japan sound would continue to evolve. But fortunately, we have dozens of solo albums from each member of the group and different combinations of different members doing collaborations that give us plenty more stuff to sink our teeth into but regardless it is a shame that they would break up at such a high point in their career then we have one of the most unique songs on here in my opinion written by david sylvian and mick karn titled sons of pioneers everything about this song is so cool the spacey and sort of psychedelic drum and bass grooves the wide variety of synth layers being introduced throughout some of them being very tense and eerie sounding as well as the deep vocal parts from david sylvian just such a spacey and vibey song. And the first song that Mick Karn got a writing credit on, I believe. Uh, if I'm wrong about that as well, please correct me in the comments. A great contrast from everything that we've heard thus far, and a great second to last song on the album to set up the final track, which uh, concludes with Cantonese Boy, which is a cool and groovy song that wraps things up really nicely. Again, incorporating those Eastern flavors, and lyrically it's talking about a Cantonese boy enlisting in the Chinese Red Army. And although I do like this song, similar to what I said about Gentlemen Take Polaroids, I do think this is probably my least favorite track on here, if I had to pick one. I do think that of the previous three albums, Quiet Life had by far the strongest closer, but like I said, it's still not a bad song by any stretch. And yeah, so great album, clearly showing further evolutions stylistically and compositionally and a very strong album to wrap the Japan discography up on. And like I said, Gentlemen Take Polaroids is my favorite album. And then after that, it's sort of a tie between this one and Quiet Life. I've always struggled picking which one I like over those two. It really depends on what mood I'm in, and that can change at any time. But I do think they are pretty neck and neck in terms of quality. So yeah, amazing final Japan album. Another one that gets an easy S. Okay, so following the end of Japan, each member would go on to release a variety of solo albums and collaboration albums, but in the late 80s they would decide to reunite for one more album, and there had been some debate as to how to market this record and whether or not they should release it under the name Japan to ensure that it would get as many listens as possible, but ultimately they decided on naming the group Rain Tree Crow, which I think was a good idea because the music on here is much different from anything that we had heard from the first five Japan albums, and musically this one was written in a much more collaborative way and there had been discussions of doing more albums under this name but unfortunately there was too much clashing between members and this would ultimately end up being their final release together so we will call this the one and only release under the name rain tree crow and it is their self-titled album from 1991 and i had to think about the scoring for this one more than any of the other albums on here but ultimately i decided to give it a b in general i do enjoy this album i will say that it is certainly an album that I need to be in a specific mood to listen to and I don't think it has the same replay value as everything in S tier but I do enjoy it more than Adolescent Sex. I don't enjoy every single track on here but I do think it has a couple of really solid songs and in general is probably the most unpredictable and surprising of their albums which isn't always necessarily a good thing but it does have some moments on this album that are very interesting and do keep the listener wondering what is going to come next. The music on this one is much more experimental and spacey and in general just more slow paced with very little resemblance to the Japan sound so it almost feels like apples and oranges when comparing this album to the Japan records but it wouldn't have felt right leaving this album off of the list. Uh, it opens up with a seven minute mostly instrumental track titled Big Wheels in Shantytown. I don't think this is the most exciting opener but it's not terrible. Uh, I remember when I first listened to this album this song really didn't make me particularly excited about what was to come on the album. I thought it dragged on for a bit too long and it got a little too jammy for me. 
But luckily, there are plenty of good songs that do follow it, like the second track, Every Color You Are. I love the vibe of this one. Nice and chill with some nice lower vocals from David. Great deep bass notes from Mick. And we hear that a lot throughout this album. One element that I really enjoy throughout this record uh, is Mick utilizing the five-string bass. And I also love the slide guitar on this one as well. After that, we continue with the title track, Rain Tree Crow, which is a very spacey two minute long track. And then that is followed by the instrumental track, Red Earth, as summertime ends. Again, very deep bass notes from Mick that just hit really nicely, combined with the sparse drum and percussion grooves. Very ambient with lots of nice layering going on. And up to this point, the past three tracks have been very chill and slow tempoed. And then we continue with my favorite song on here, Pocket Full of Change. Again, very much in that chill vein, but the drum groove does provide a little more momentum and drive to this song. I really love the drum groove and again, the deep bass notes and David's lower vocal melodies. Great instrumental layering as well. This song is just such a cool vibe. Then we have a 45 second transition track titled Boats for Burning. Again, very mellow and dreary. Uh, and we have a couple of those little short transitional tracks that are sort of sandwiched in between a lot of these songs. Uh, and then that is followed by another instrumental track titled New Moon at Red Deer Wallow, which features some beautiful bass clarinet work from Mick. Once again, really great deep bass parts. The bass work is definitely one of my favorite elements of this album and something that I think really adds to the dark and mysterious tone of this album. Then we continue with Blackwater, which was the single from this album, and I would say by far the most upbeat and, for lack of a better term, normal sounding song uh, on here. An absolutely beautiful track. Definitely my second favorite on here. Uh, this one almost gives me some hints of like a later Pink Floyd David Gilmore sort of vibe. Really great placement uh, of this track too. A nice little change in contrast and pick up in the mood. And then that is followed by an experimental 80 second instrumental track titled A Reassuringly Dull Sunday. A very interesting change in pace from Blackwater. And then we have Black Crow hits Shoeshine City. Very cool drum and bass grooves again and really cool ominous layers on top. Some nice guitar work from Bill Nelson of Bebop Deluxe as well, which is a nice little surprising addition to this album. And then we continue with another instrumental track titled Scratchings on the Bible Belt. Another one with very experimental combinations of instruments, percussion, and tonal textures. And I wouldn't say that I'm crazy about all of the more experimental instrumental tracks on here, but if I am in the right frame of mind, this album can definitely take me through a pretty bizarre and interesting journey. Uh, the album then concludes with Cries and Whispers, which ends things on that more slower, eerie sort of vibe, which is really the main mood for the majority of this album. So like I said, this is very much an album that I need to be in a specific mood to listen to, but the tracks that I do like, I do find more enjoyable than pretty much all of the songs on Adolescent Sex, with the exception of the title track. And in general, I do kind of feel like it's sort of even with obscure alternatives. Uh, although, like I said, this music is almost unrecognizable from Japan, so it does feel a little bit weird comparing them. But since it still is the same band writing together, it did feel right including it on this list. So not a bad album, but definitely not an album that I can just listen to at any given time. But it certainly has a handful of very enjoyable songs and really takes you through an interesting and bizarre journey. So this one will get a B. All right, we did it. We went through the five Japan albums and the one Rain Tree Crow album, and this is where I ended up. A very fun and adventurous discography to go through that is full of surprises and consists of some of my favorite music of the late 70s and early 80s. And like I said, please let me know your thoughts in the comments. I would love to hear where you agree and disagree and where you rank each of these albums as well. So that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. I hope it was informative and I hope you enjoyed it. And please feel free to check out my other tier lists and see if there's anything else that you like. I will have them linked in the description and in the comments as well. All right, that's about it. Thanks again for listening and I will see you at the next video. Take care.